from the silly to the serious on the line with us right now, David Toddington. He's the founder and CEO of, is it T2, David? Uh, TII. TII, the Digital Fugitive Hunter and Chair of the Open Source Intelligence and Research Association, OSIRA. Uh, David, welcome to the new screensavers. Great to talk to you. Thank you very much, and thank so, you for having me. So, uh, when you go to see movies like Jason Bourne, do you just laugh out loud at the stupid tech that they're showing there? It was an action film, and okay. let's say it was uh, it was good entertainment, if nothing else. But I imagine uh, that you have some technologies, probably that haven't even made their way to Hollywood screenwriters, uh, to do what you do. Does law enforcement really use technology to track fugitives? Sure. I mean, law enforcement uses a variety of different types of technologies, some of which are publicly known about, uh, others maybe not so much. What it really comes down to, though, is not just the technology being the answer in order to find a suspect of a particular criminal activity, but also the right mindset for the investigator themselves. I mean, let's face it, it's, it's still police investigations. It just happens to be in the digital realm, the digital world, which means that we have to rely on technology now and understand technology and able to be able to do that job effectively. Well, that's really important. I hear other people say the same thing is, you know, we focus so much on the technology, on crypto and, and uh, forensics, uh, but forget that really kind of traditional police work still is the key in general. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I would agree. I mean, there are certainly within many police agencies, all really uh, specialized tech crime agencies. And the way that we kind of, if you will, draw an analogy, think of a Formula One race car team, uh, the pit crew, the research and development people, the engineers. I mean, that's the tech crime unit. And then you've got the drivers. These are the frontline investigators. And that's what we really are. We're not so much the techies as we are the drivers. And that's what we train people to do is to drive these Formula One race cars albeit, in this case, the Formula One race car is a successful investigation. I see that in education sometimes, where once technology comes in, people, some teachers go, oh, forget teaching, I just use an iPad and I'm done. And I would, I would guess that there are some agencies and some law enforcement professionals who say, I got a stingray, I don't need to do any more uh, work, I could just use this to find the, the suspect. Um, so part of your process is, 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 is talking about how technology works with what they already do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And understanding people. It's all about behavioral people. science. Yeah. Understanding the people that, let's say if it's pursuing a fugitive, understanding that person and being very careful of what we call actor-observer asymmetry, not asking that question, okay, what would I do if I was this guy? The fact is, yeah. you're not that guy. You don't think the way that guy does. You've got to get inside their head. You've got to use technology, things like social media, data mining, to be able to build a lifestyle profile of that person, to understand who they are to the best of your ability, and really then to be able to predict what their next move just might be. So this just becomes a tool. Although every time I watch one of these Bourne movies, the first thing Jason Bourne does is he grabs the cell phone from the woman he's saving and throws it out, <laughs> throws it out the window. This, in some ways, the smartphone with its GPS, its microphone, its camera, has to be the best gift to law enforcement ever, or not. Well, it all depends. I mean, the fact is, is that mobile phones are probably the most awesome tracking device ever invented, and we're all carrying them around all the time. Now, we have power in deciding who knows what about us. If you just read the terms and conditions of something like location services and every app that you set up, you do have a fair amount of control. But even people who think that they might be outsmarting law enforcement by using things like burner phones, for example, well, fact is, one of the things that we do is we don't just focus on the person that we're pursuing, we focus on their entire network as well. We get an understanding of who their network is. There's going to be weaknesses in there somewhere. There's going to be certain phone calls made and we can do some pattern analysis around those phone calls to determine who the people of importance are within that fugitives network and then we can start to target those people as well that's become an interesting point in the conversation and this i'm really glad you're here because you can clarify this for us one of the fears uh that uh, civil libertarians have is that law enforcement in order to gather this meta information casts a wide net uh, a stingray is a good example that gathers in information not only about your suspect and not only even about your suspect's uh, c contacts, but everybody in a region. And I think there's some concern that that look, starts to look like a fishing expedition. Um, yeah. So tell us about that. Mass surveillance is, is a difficult and it's a sticky issue. I mean, if you're searching for a needle in a haystack, one of the questions you've got to ask is, do I really want to make that haystack bigger? 
uh, more data doesn't necessarily mean more value. In fact, there's a process that we go through understanding the difference between data, information and knowledge. So we have data, which could be metadata, call records, for example. When we group that together, we start to get information. And when we contextualize that, when we start to put it in perspective, when we understand who these people are, we can turn that into knowledge. And what we want to be doing is making decisions based on knowledge, not making decisions based on data. And I think you've hit the nail on the head as well. Technology is simply a tool and it's a neutral tool as well. So when we start talking about things like backdoors in technology, what we have to be very careful about is that in the same way that the good guys can use those backdoors to arguably more effectively solve crime, the fact is the bad guys can exploit those back doors as well. And once that happens, we're all less safe. So use on the, on the encryption debate come down in the favor of widespread use of encryption. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And what that requires then is yes, law enforcement's job is going to be more difficult. But again, we need to think differently and we need to be more innovative working within the frameworks that we have. And in fact, uh, some law enforcement, it's interesting because even there's no agreement within the government as some, some agencies like uh, the FBI and their director, James Comey, says we've got to have a backdoor into encryption. And the NSA says, no, no, encryption protects us and protects our infrastructure and is vital. And so there isn't even an agreement within uh, law enforcement. There's a, there's a debate, probably a healthy debate going on right now. Well, exactly. I mean, there is no, um, certainly, I mean, we work all around the world. We, we see many different agencies, many different ways of doing things. And there's no sort of one specific path. Again, we've got to be thinking laterally, not in very linear fashions. Yeah. So we talk yeah. about the law of disruption, Moore's law, the, the rate of change of technology. Technology is a very sharp thing. When we compare that to the rate of change in society, the rate of change Absolutely. within business, these are exponentially less. And then we look at the very bottom of legislation, the blunt instrument that is legislation. <laughs> I mean, how is it that we have this very sharp edge of technology and legislation that can address all of those issues? It will never happen. So yeah. what really needs to happen is that we all need to become more aware of our rights and our obligations and responsibilities to protect our information. As we say, privacy is not important until it's too late. That's an important issue as well. But we, it's a very, very um, complex debate for which there will not never be an easy answer. Yeah. Hmm. I could see it. it's it's quite challenging, and yet the NSA is building. They call it Bumble Hive, the Utah data center, the largest data center in history to, well, store information about us, right? Information it collects, uh, not about uh, well domestic surveillance, I guess. So I guess it is about us as much as it is about international <laughs> surveillance. Um, and you could see why some people are concerned that uh, that our government is is collecting all this uh, information. Well, by all means. I mean, the fact is we live in free democratic societies and we're extremely fortunate. Not everybody has uh, that level of fortune. Some people live in, in under oppressive regimes where privacy is that much more important, where simply saying the wrong thing could land you in a world of trouble that we can't even imagine. Yeah. Um, the fact is, is that surveillance also has a chilling effect. If we believe that we're under surveillance all the time, then we're going to be very much more careful about what we say. We're going to self-censor. And we have to ask ourselves, is that the society we want to live in as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree 100%. By the way, that page that I showed, lest anybody think that was a real NSA page, is actually a parody NSA page uh, about the data center. And I don't think the uh, NSA would actually call it Bumble Hive. Uh, <laughs> but others do, don't they? So... Um, on balance, is technology making life easier for law enforcement or harder for law enforcement? It's doing exactly both, and it depends on how law enforcement approaches it. Uh, no question, the bad guys now have opportunities that they've never had before, but we say law enforcement also has opportunities yeah. that they've never had before as well. And yeah. this is an issue that permeates all levels of law enforcement. The fact is we live in a digital society. We live in a society now in which information is the commodity of greatest value. And we have to move away from the idea of the fact that, well, street cops don't need to know technology. Yes, they do. Um, we find on average that uh, within a 12 hour shift, many Canadian general duty police officers spend one hour online during that wow. shift using technology to assist them in investigating the most common of criminal activities from domestic violence to petty theft and everything in between. Yeah. I have to imagine that social network, you mentioned just a little bit ago, uh, social networks 
I would imagine that's another great gift that, that you've been handed. And suddenly we live in this world where people live their lives not only for themselves, but for everyone else. I mean, has that just kind of opened up the playing field, the, the number of opportunities? Oh, very much so. I mean, certain tools that can be used for mining, uh, say, geo-specific social media posts that are publicly posted can be tremendously advantageous. Uh, for example, music festivals. Uh, what is the general feeling? Uh, what is the is the, is the sentiment? Um, are people getting stressed out? Is that the possibility that things could be going wrong? Is there a need for police? Oh, interesting. Yeah. And all of those sorts of things that can give a commander who's responsible for a large number of people a real sense of what's going on on the ground. You could actually sure. do sentiment analysis on the on the social sharing from that festival to see if people are, are if there's potential for trouble there. Oh, most definitely. Wow. And think also about things like critical incidents, for example. Yeah. It's a, an additional tool to give you an idea of the tactical situation on the ground, in addition to the fact that, let's say, it's a hostage taking. Who's the person who has taken the hostages? What are their issues? What are the key points that a negotiator may need to know and learn about that person in order to bring that situation to a successful and peaceful conclusion? One of the responses to this notion of going dark and I, I can't remember, I might have been the director of the NSA who said this is, oh, don't worry, <laughs> we've got the Internet of Things. We're going to have hmm. sensors everywhere. And aren't we all wearing wearables now that are collecting all sorts of information? I, I, you know, in every Perry Mason TV episode, the question comes up, where were you on the night of August 20th, 2013? <laughs> Nobody has to ask that anymore. It's much more likely the attorney will say, well, according to this, you were right here. Mm -hmm. Um, are, are wearables giving people information, uh, giving law enforcement information about uh, suspects? Oh, absolutely. I mean, wearables can be incredibly powerful and useful things in an investigation. And I always would suggest that anyone who is using one of the devices that constitutes the Internet of Things, you've already got to give some thought to privacy. A, a recent case, for example, was a, uh, a rape uh, complainant uh, complaining that she had been sexually assaulted. And there wasn't something that seemed quite right to the investigator uh, about the complaint itself. Turned out she was wearing a Fitbit. An examination of the Fitbit device itself indicated a very relaxed pulse rate during the time that <laughs> apparently sexual assault took place. Of course, that doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, in, in wow. that case, it led to a public mischief um, charge against the, the complainant for Holy making a cow. false allegation. So, so, I mean, yes, these, these things are very important. What do you tell... Uh I mean, I, I, so on the one hand, you're telling law enforcement, you still have to do your job. It's, it's, it's the difference between data and knowledge uh, and between knowledge and understanding. You still have to use your brain and your, and your instincts. Mm -hmm. But what do you tell uh, your friends and your family, people who aren't working in law enforcement, uh, about privacy? What, what do you tell them to do? Very simply, privacy is not important until it's too late. We live our lives, we feel like we have a problem in the world, but when we are targeted one day, it could be targeted by a, a hacker, uh, any number of malicious individuals who decide they're going to target us for any number of reasons. All of those bits of data that we have left behind, these, this digital detritus, as we call it, uh, that's in the public sphere, that can be used against us in ways that we never possibly imagined. The most innocuous pieces of information can be leveraged significantly by the bad guys and used against us. And that's something that we always have to be aware of. Yet at the same time, it's a balance because the fact is, if we decide we're gonna go dark, we're gonna cut ourselves out of social media, that's something that we really, you know, it, it's it's an advantage to us in order to stay in touch with our family and friends. It's how we socialize. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't wanna live disconnected. I want to carry a cell phone. That's the constant thing about Facebook, for example. You know, people people have this growing backlash against Facebook, but if you actually chose to strip yourself away from Facebook entirely, in a lot of ways, that ends up mean meaning not only going dark on the service, but going dark to your friends and family to a certain sure. degree. It's, it's how we socialize now, and yeah. that that is the real challenge. And these are the questions we have to ask ourselves. And, and really think about what privacy means to us and what we're willing to do to maintain privacy. The fact is security, it takes effort. It's not easy stuff to do. And very often we'll get to that point where we think, oh, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. What the heck? I don't really care if anyone's collecting this information. Well, that may be how we feel now, but the fact is the internet is written in pen. It's not written in yes. pencil. Computers never forget. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, David, you work with a lot of law enforcement. 
um, you know, we're we're constantly here grappling with these this issue of of public safety mm -hmm. versus personal privacy. Um, is it is it your sense that law enforcement understands and cares about that? And uh, most of the people you're working with are. I want this to be the case. Are really trying to do the best job they can and still protect people's individual liberty. Generally, I think yes. I mean, the people that we work with, and, and my experience in policing, uh, some of the best people I've ever ever worked with in my life. And I mean, when we're talking about levels of personal integrity and wanting to do the right thing and being devoted to public service, so yes, absolutely. But it's a little bit like saying all techies think a certain <laughs> way. It's right. very difficult to say all law enforcement no. things a certain yeah. way because you're going to see a whole wide range of, of feelings, emotions, and sentiments within the law enforcement world as well. And yes, I know people that absolutely uh, believe that encryption should be protected. And I also know people that believe that encryption is the worst thing that's ever happened to law enforcement right. as well. It should be building back doors. So, you know, there are many debates and arguments within the law enforcement community, certainly from the perspective that we have and what I see. Uh, there is no one simple answer that really can be used to blanket all of law enforcement as well. It is it is absolutely a real challenge. And I think sometimes as techies, as privacy advocates, we err on the side of kind of painting all law enforcement in a negative light. And and I really want to be so clear that I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, our public service professionals are people who daily head towards danger and 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 do it to out of a sense of service out of sense of uh, protecting us and I really respect uh, those people and I also understand that there are some bad apples and I think that a well-run uh, uh, law enforcement agency is going to be constantly assessing its staff and making sure uh, that that you know to serve and protect is is really the genuine goal of the agency and uh, I'm, th I'm thrilled to hear that you get that and you understand that and you're aware of the balance. And, uh, and, I, and I, th you know, I, I just want to really respect our men and women in blue and, and, and the job that they're doing. And, you, you work mostly in, I detect a Canadian uh, lilt to your... It's like the Canadian accent, yes. Do you work mostly well, with actually, Canadian law enforcement or...? Actually all over the world. Yeah. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of work in the UK. In fact, I just returned a few days ago from Australia and Singapore working with different agencies there. A point I just want to touch on as well, and that is uh, we, there's this very often perception that law enforcement is constantly walking into the face of danger, and I don't want to dispute that. But at the same time, think about those investigators who spend hour yeah. after hour, day after day of drudge work yeah. going through records, sitting behind a desk. There's nothing glamorous about it at yeah. all. And that is a level of dedication unto itself. Yeah. And, uh, and that's one they of the care a lot. No. unspoken aspects of law enforcement yeah. and police work we don't often think about. Yeah, very, very good point. And those are the people who are often doing the, the forensics work that needs to be done. Um, thank you so much, David. I really, it was great to talk to you. David Toddington is the founder and CEO, CEO of TII. He is a digital fugitive hunter. I hope we're not going to see you on the Discovery Channel with a show of your very own. Maybe this. <laughs> you and you and Dog, the bounty hunter, and chair of the oh, I love this OSIRA, which is the Open Source Intelligence and Research Association. Um, he's one of the good guys. Thank you, David. I really appreciate your time. I think we have a lot more to talk about. Well, let's come, let's get together again. You bet, Leo, and thank you so much for having me. It's been thank a real you. pleasure. Really, really interesting.